My name is Scott Golly, and I am currently Vice President and Fire and Building Safety Service Line Leader for Special Hazards. Um, I've been with Jensen Hughes now for a little over 21 years, and I've been in the industry for um, a little over 28 years. Appreciate you taking some time out of your day to, to hear about um, what is becoming a really big issue in my industry uh, and likely yours. Um, I, I will tell you as I go through this, you know, I am I am not an expert in fluorine free foam or the environmental impacts of it, but we work with some of the best in the industry. All right, so let's talk about the types of firefighting foam. Okay, so there are many different types of foam. Uh, class A foams, these are uh, often what you see dumped out of the aircraft on on forest fires and things like that. Class A foams are really designed around wood paper, uh, and uh, they're usually uh, medium, high expansion foams. They can be low expansion foams. Uh, class B foams, probably more what we're going to talk about today. These are usually low or high expansion foam. Uh, their early generations of protein foam were used many years in the fire department, and I had rough exposure to that uh, when I first joined the fire department. So protein foam, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, uh, has a high concentration of decomposed biological stuff gross, uh, like fish guts and stuff. And when you get it on your turnout gear, you basically throw away your turnout gear afterwards because the stench is horrendous. That's been my exposure to protein foam, not very commonly used anymore. Fluoroprotein, so protein where we introduced uh, fluorination to it to, to help its effects. And then film forming fluoroproteins, uh, that was an evolution of the fluoroproteins, and then aqueous film forming foam, probably the one that was most commonly used, what most widely accepted, and now we're getting a lot of calls from clients to help them replace it. Uh, then we've got alcohol resistant AFFF. Uh, not all foams work well with an alcohol based product, so you have to be very careful at looking at that. And then last on the list here is the synthetic fluorine free foams, which is kind of what the evolution of the product has become to try and get rid of PFAS in the product. And then we have what I would kind of refer to as non-foams, things that we add to water to improve the performance of water in firefighting, which is hard to do, but definitely can be done. All right, so now we're going to focus on Class B firefighting foams. Where have we been using them? Where do you see them? Uh, where are your clients going to call you from for advice? It's a very versatile product. In the commercial world, petrochemical world, we've been using it in tank farms, fuel storage, fuel handling systems, um, any of the petrochemical industry, if you've worked in that for any any length of time, you've been exposed to the AFFF applications. Uh, Department of Defense, big consumer of AFFF foam over the years, developer of AFFF foam, very commonly used in aircraft rescue and, and firefighting, but it's an extremely commonly used aircraft rescue product. And then again, aviation crash rescue. Uh, vehicle stowage and hangars, uh, flight decks, again, you know, you've got uh, liquid petroleum-based fuels there. Munitions, DOD munitions, that'll come up again here later in conversation. Machinery spaces, pump rooms, anywhere where we have uh, petroleum products or, or flammable liquids is a common application for AFFF foam. And then the Federal Aviation Administration, most major airports, you'll see uh, AFFF foam. We'll talk a little bit more about that here. So AFFF was developed in the 60s. And the reason was we had increasing hazards on our shipboard applications in the Navy. And the Navy has kind of led the way on the development of AFFF. Initial military spe specifications were issued in 69, and the first qualified products were delivered in the 70s, early 70s, 1970. So synthetic foam made from chemical surfactants that produce a thin film, a low surface tension between the fuel source and the foam blanket. So the PFAS component of the foam creates a nice film, and it, it acts as a polymeric membrane. Uh, so how does it extinguish? So the aqueous foam creates a fuel vapor seal, and that's what that film does for us, and that's what we've lost in fluorine-free. So the film reseals quickly. Um, I, I have fond memories of putting out fuel fires in fire academy, and then we would intentionally take sticks and, and shake the foam up and relight the fire, and then the foam would push back in and put it right back out. Uh, interesting product. Foam blanket limits oxygen access to the fuel and the vapor transport to the fire. Um, and then the foam blanket adds a cooling effect and then maintains that cooling effect and that blanketing effect over time. So it's required for U.S. Navy ships, U.S. Coast Guard operations, 
DOD aviation facilities, um, it, you know, it's been required for many, many years in safe operation of those facilities. The Navy's still readily using it until we get some solid mil spec tested foams, which we'll talk about here in a minute that Jerry Back has been uh, leading in helping find a solution for. Non mil spec, AFFF has been marketed for many, many years, but commercial airport aviation, petrochemical again. So why do we need to replace AFFF? And, and this is a, a tough subject to, to, to grasp in my mind. So uh, any product that contains per or polyfluoral alpha substances. Perfluorinated uh, means that all the carbon atoms are fully fluorinated. And then polyfluorinated means that some of the carbons are not fully fluorinated, but typically have hydrogen. So it includes over 5,000 plus man-made fluorinated chemicals that did not exist prior to the 1940s, right? So these are man-made chemicals that are really good at what they're doing by the advancements of science. And now we're kind of realizing, uh-oh, there's, there's, a, there's a negative to them. So they're extremely stable across multiple temperatures and conditions. And the fluorine carbon bond is one of the strongest in nature. That creates a lot of our problems we're going to continue to talk about. So it's extremely resistant to biological, chemical, and thermal breakdown, which uh, when we talk about remediation, that um, adds some complexity there as well. It repels both water and oil to act as surfactants and dispersants. Now, the challenge is, and what we're seeing with the Novec 1230 and a lot of the other freons and things that are out there in the industry is the definition I'd say here continues to change. It's not really changing, it's evolving, right? We're, we're realizing the negatives to some of these PFASs and we're expanding the definition to encompass more and more products. And the problem is a lot of the products that are getting pulled under that umbrella are really good at what they do and we don't have great replacements for them. And that's kind of where the fluorine foam challenge came from. So what are the impacts of PFASs? I, I should clarify here, right? I, I am brushing over impact of PFAS and PFAS. By no means am I an expert in it. We have an environmental team that is. As a family, they share similar characteristics. Uh, they're persistent, which means uh, they resist degradation in nature from light, water, heat, you name it. Okay? Uh, they're bioaccumulative, which means uh, the chemicals taken up in organisms and distributed throughout, right? So it gets into the water, fish consume it. Now it's in the fish, birds consume the fish, you know, and it, it kind of evolves like that. And we'll talk more about that here as we move on. And it's toxic. It exhibits a detrimental effect on the target vectors. So chain length matters. And, and this is where a lot of the definitions are still evolving. As a general rule of thumb, the way we've always talked about it is the longer the chain, so eight carbon molecules or more, it bioaccumulates more readily. Shorter the chain, C6 and below, are more easily transported in the environment and may be more toxic. So the, the data there is still coming in. For those of you that are familiar with the AFFF lawsuit with 3M, which I believe they just, there was a finding on it not too long ago, um, within the last couple of weeks. That whole lawsuit is based on health effects of PFAS in AFFF and that it's a potential a carcinogenic. Example of how the PFAS is getting into our environment. So we have Firefighting foams end up in the groundwater, get into bodies of water, um, the biota spread it, right? So fish consume it, people eat the fish, you know, and, and what we found is that, you know, PFAS is spreading at a, a surprising rate to areas where PFAS may not have even been used. A registry Council is a phenomenal wealth of information for anything PFAS related, including what states are fully banning things like foam. What are the recommendations on remediation? All that is covered there. It's a really great resource. All right. So the other interesting thing that I find the most intriguing when I look at PFAS is it's not just foams. So PFASs are used extensively throughout the environment. I have a, a colleague in my scout troop who's a big environmental engineer in the state of Maryland. And the applications and cleanups that they're seeing associated with PFAS is far greater than I ever expected um, the impact to be. But carpet and um, fabric stain resistance or water resistance, things like Scotchgard, um, Gore-Texes, those are all manufactured using PFAS, PFAS in the process. Paper, cardboard packaging, which includes food uh, packaging. Uh, any nonstick coatings, the Teflons, electroplating, electroplating chemicals, which obviously there's a lot of nastiness in the electroplating processes, but 
that's just an example. Um, beauty products, and then firefighting foams, which we've already talked about, and then a lot of the fire suppression clean agents. But PFASs are used everywhere, right? It's the modern, it's, it's science evolved into creating great new products. My name is Scott Golly, and feel free to reach out to me anytime with any questions. I'm certainly here to support you. Thank you.